the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus went out and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of, of, or no root, and they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the lure of the wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, let the gift of your life continue to grow in us, drawing us from death to faith, to hope, and to love. Keep us alive in Christ Jesus. Keep us watchful in prayer and true to his teaching till your glory is revealed in us. Amen. Jesus spoke through parables to his disciples and to those with ears to listen. According to some professors, the parable of the sower is found between stories of opposition to the gospel. If we were to review chapters 11 through 12 in the Gospel of Matthew, we would find several stories of opposition to the gospel. And chapter 13 concludes with Jesus' own hometown rejecting him. This parable then best serves to explain why the gospel finds places and takes root and grow in some people, but not among others. Those of you who enjoy gardening and planting seeds understand that seeds will grow or not grow all on their own. Nothing we do changes what the seed will ultimately do or not do. We cannot predict which plants will yield, and we cannot predict how many flowers or vegetables will be grown. Perhaps the plants that are watered and fed more will grow and yield more, but don't we do this with all the seeds? Don't we water them all the same? And then we wonder why some seeds don't produce at all? Planting seeds is also a great lesson to remind us that the seed will not yield its fruits until they are covered, buried, where they are to die onto themselves, that they might yield something greater than themselves. Seeds grow through a different pattern, a different cycle. And bear with me, some of you have heard my story, but every time I read this particular gospel lesson, I cannot help but be taken back to my time and teaching kindergarten. At that time, I was reading the story, The Tiny Seed, and one little child so excitedly stood up and said, I understand now what Father Martinez was talking about, about the seeds and life everlasting. I get it, she said. Seeds never really die because they give us flowers, and then the flowers give us seeds and give us more flowers. They really don't die. They really live forever. They just aren't the same. So we don't really die, right? We just change, don't we? Talk about fertile ground in this little five-year-old. 
She understood that parable that took Jesus a whole paragraph to explain to adult disciples and listeners. This is a, not a simple way to grasp the meaning of eternal life, is it? But think about it. Think of the process. First, there must be a dying unto oneself. That is, we must die to the old life that we might come back in a new life. Just as a seed emerges not in its old state, but in a totally different state, so we emerge in a different state if we really allow ourselves to be changed. When we allow ourselves to be changed, we really are not the same anymore. And yes, we probably won't be recognized. And sometimes even we ourselves will try to go back to that old place where we buried our old selves, only to discover that we, like the seed we once knew, are no longer there. That place, like a tomb, now seems dark and empty. Seeds do serve to, to remind us about resurrection. Our Lord was not in the tomb when the women came to anoint his body. So the seed is no longer found where it is planted. Mary Magdalene did not recognize Jesus when she saw him. Flowers and fruit no longer look like the seed that bore them. Like the buried seed that changed into new life, we too can die to our old life and grow into a new life. And seed serves to remind us that we are not experts in all things. If it were left up to me, there probably wouldn't be too many okra, marigolds, and bean plants. Not because I don't like them. It's because, you see, I can recognize the flower when it's in full bloom, and I can recognize an okra or a bean pod, but I can't tell weed from seed when the first shoots begin to appear. And I suspect that I'm not the only one. How many fruit-yielding plants judged to be weeds have been hastily pulled up, thus losing their life and losing their fruit? How many times have we, through thought, word, or deed, pulled up our own or someone else's dreams and desires or prematurely changed original intentions? Seeds remind us to be careful with our judgments and our divisions. Seeds and growing are like the process of everyday life. It's enjoyable, but it's hard work. It requires our discipline and our care. We learn to care for our daily living as one cares for a garden. We allow our old selves to be buried and our new selves to grow and mature and yield its proper fruit. We protect from harm as best we can. We carefully remove those weeds, those demons that challenge us, that worry us, that frighten us and discourage us and depress us. As best we can, we remove all those things that will not allow us to live gracefully and thankfully, that is, full of grace and thankfulness. In today's parable, Jesus began by saying, a sower went out to sow. Notice that the sower scared the seeds before choosing where the seeds were to land. Obviously, the sower was not an Episcopalian. If he were, he would have first set up a committee to decide what kind of seeds, to decide how many seeds, and to decide the location of the land, the soil upon which the seeds were to be scattered. But you see, God in his infinite wisdom understood that there's many kinds of soils upon which seeds will land. There is that soil, that path where the ground is hardened and the seeds are destroyed with the daily trampling by people, animals, vehicles. There is that shallow soil, that rocky ground where there is little chance for the seeds to take root. There is ground overgrown by thorns to check out any possibility for growth. There is fertile ground where seeds can produce abundantly. Knowing that all soil is not fertile does not discourage nor stop the sower from scattering the seeds. 
The sower scatters the seeds and the wind carries the seeds to fall upon all four grounds. How many seeds fall on fertile ground and grow is not controlled by the sower. The sower simply sows the seeds. The seeds will grow or not grow upon the soil in which they land and the gospel will take root and grow among some people like Jesus and some of his disciples, but not among others like one of his disciples and many of the Sadducees and some of the Pharisees. A sower went out to sow. The sower scattered the seeds before choosing where the seeds were to land. I believe that as churches, this is a very important lesson for us to hear. As a church, we often first want to find the project that will promise us the greater growth and recognition. We want to find the location for the building that will promise the best exposure. We want to attract the people who will promise us the better budgets. Don't get me wrong. These things are not to be ignored completely, but they should not be the prime focus or the only reason we minister with others. We should not try to control how or where growth will take place. The gospel will fall upon the ears that our Lord has already prepared for listening. Our job as a church is simply to sow the seeds of good news faithfully, lovingly, hospitably, and may I add, boldly and bravely. For with our Lord at our side, whom do we have to fear? Our job is not only to read the gospel, it is to be the gospel. For we may be the only Bible that some people will ever know. Thus far, I have spoken about seeds and gardening. Perhaps like me, you imagine the sower to be Jesus. But let me leave you with this question. Could Jesus be the seeds? Robert Capon certainly gives me something to think about. His viewpoint is that believing Jesus to be the sower leaves us, like the disciples and all whom Jesus tries so hard to teach, still not understanding the parable. Anyway, I leave you with this question and food for thought. Where does Jesus fall in our life? Where does he fall in our heart? Where does he fall in our mind? Perhaps it's best to prepare a fertile place where Jesus can take root and grow, that our lives may be nourished and strengthened, giving us courage to continue on our journey.